Our scripture reading this morning is from Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 through 31. This is uh, Jacob. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything he had. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then the man said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> God, we often meet you as we struggle most in life. We might be struggling with understanding how you are present with us. We might just be struggling to accept ourselves and know that we are loved by you and others. We might wonder if we deserve all that we have or if we are about to come to the end of all that is good. Like Jacob, we sometimes shiver in the night in fear or anxiety. Yet the psalmist assures us that you hear us when we cry out. Sometimes when we are alone, we find it difficult to know for sure, but show us your love anyway. Open our eyes to see your loving face. Assure us that all those you have loved, you will always love. When we are in need, you have compassion for us and and provide abundantly for all of creation. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Life can be difficult. Sometimes the difficulties we face in life come from our own decisions that we have made. And sometimes we are the recipients of suffering through either the deliberate or accidental choices and actions of others. When others act to hurt us with purpose, we can wonder how justice will be done. When we have done things to hurt others, sometimes with purpose, we also wonder how justice can be done And sometimes we even wonder because we understand that people act without thinking, yet people are hurt. And how is justice found in those cases? As people of faith, we seek the help of God, understanding that some kinds of suffering, illness, come to us all eventually. 
that most of us will be ill at one time or another, that all of us will eventually come to the end of our lives, and that each of us might suffer the consequences that follow our own or, our, or others' decisions. And so we look at the life of Jacob. And we've been following the life of, life of Jacob this summer. Jacob caused suffering in his family because of the ways he took advantage of people, people he was meant to love, people who were meant to love him. And Jacob was hurt by those decisions as much as he was hurt by the decisions that others made, the things that they decided to do. As we followed his life, um, he's been in exile, kind of, for a while, long enough to have 11 children and four wives, two wives and two servants. He finally decided it was time to come home. And by coming home to the land that God had promised, he had to face up to the hurt that he had caused. Even if he was afraid that it might cost him his life and would very possibly cost him the kind of life, the kind of resources, the kind of wealth that he had built for his family. Just a reminder, the story of his birth, we read in, in worship just a few weeks ago. And in that story, we anticipate the conflicts between he and his brother Esau. Even before they were born, they were twins, his mother wondered at the struggle that seemed to go on inside of her. And when she prayed, God said that her sons would be competitors and even enemies in life. When Jacob was born second, the younger son, he was said to have, hold, have a hold on his brother's heel, a sign they saw as him as he, as that he would eventually try to usurp Esau's place as the oldest, and he did. We heard the story of how he traded stew with Esau for part of their father's wealth when Esau was starving, and his for Esau's part of his father's wealth, and he and his mother plotted to take Esau's authority as eldest brother and receive that blessing. Now, when that happened, Esau vowed to kill him. And that's the last word that Jacob had heard from Esau in the story we're reading. And that's the last we've heard of Esau as well. But the story of Jacob continued as he traveled to Haran to find a wife, as seemed to be the family custom. And he found two wives and their two servants, who were also mothers to his, it says 11 children at this point. I think two were born in Canaan. Jacob, who had taken Esau's wealth, his place of authority, is returning to Canaan in today's scripture. And if you read this entire story in scripture, in the chapters that lead up to the text in the 32nd chapter, you can read, you can hear that Jacob is kind of nervous about coming to meet his brother again. The last he knew, Esau had vowed to kill him. And he also seemed to understand, as he had matured, how Esau might be justified in how he felt. In other words, he was carrying both the fear of what his brother might do and the guilt of how much he had wronged his brother. So the nights before he would cross the stream, the river, into the land of Canaan, he sent his whole family, including his servants, all of his children, their spouses, and their children over. Then he spent the night alone. Except scripture says, as soon as it was dark, a man began to wrestle with him. Came and wrestled with him until daybreak. The church has usually interpreted this text to mean that either God or an angel came to rest, wrestle with him that night. 
Maybe that's true. It's hard to know. It says a man. Um, some think this story is a very old story and refers to some kind of desert spirit that people believed lived in the wilderness, ready to struggle with those who were alone and unprotected. Whoever this really is, the struggle is a poignant symbol of how I imagine Jacob's heart and mind in this time of his life. I imagine that if he had truly matured some and changed and grew up, but he still might want have, have wanted the talent to trick and sweet talk and persuade people to get what he wanted. And there are a few stories in the in-between stories about how he had kind of tricked Laban, his tricky father-in-law. But I think he learned to set boundaries on those behaviors that he enjoyed. He learned to have a few ethical boundaries in the meantime. And I think this night, before he thought he might see his brother again, he was remembering the times he had acted without rules, without boundaries, taking advantage because he could, taking advantage of his brother's need, taking advantage of his father's blindness. This night's struggle in Jacob's life is as much a struggle with guilt and remorse as it is with fear and anxiety. He really couldn't know what the morning would bring if he would have a home or come home to a war, he might have to fight for his land. He might come home to a threat of death or that Esau would try to claim from him all that he had because what he had was based on what he had stolen. Now, Jacob still was a persuasive man. He had planned ahead a little bit even he sent his family across the river, but he also sent ahead a very generous gift of animals and gold, riches that he had accumulated while he was in Haran, sent it ahead to Esau. But I'm sure he wondered, was it enough? Would it do the trick? What would his brother do? And still he struggled with the man struggled with the angel, with God. I think the biggest reason to argue that this is a representative of God is God often comes to us in exactly the way we need. Jacob was probably not in a quietly meditative mood that night. He probably was very nervous, had a lot of energy. This kind of physical wrestling gave him a chance to sweat out the tension that had been building probably for years. And the story says that it was an even match. The man met his every move. And finally, when the match was at a tie, the man wrenched, match was at a tie, the man wrenched Jacob's hip out of joint. And still, Jacob hung on for a blessing. I can imagine God smiling at this point, face to face with this stubborn man, knowing that deep down this was the Jacob God knew, trying to get all that he could get even in this moment. So the blessing he was given was the name of the nation he was already fathering. Jacob become Israel. El always means God. And Israel means or sounds like the word for striving, struggling, laboring with God. Israel. Jacob, now Israel, then named the place of his struggle Penuel, because there he believed he saw God face to face. And as another reminder, when he left that place, he walked with a limp. Perhaps he had seen God face to face. Or he had a powerful experience of God's work within him. 
But then he has to go on to the next day. I didn't read this text, but the text goes on. He still had to face his brother, the brother that might want to kill him. But I think in this text, it's almost like I've seen God face to face. Whatever happens tomorrow happens tomorrow or today in the text. Whatever happens happens, and I'm all right with that because I have seen God's face to face. I don't think any of us would wonder or be surprised that Jacob had experienced life as a struggle. Some of us know that kind of struggle better than others. We might find moments of happiness and still there are times that seem harder than we've known before. Or we have memories of life in a time before now that were the hardest we will ever know. Childhood might have been a time of poverty, concern, even a time that still haunts our dreams with tragedy or trauma. We all have times when we struggle. We all have times when we understand that Jacob had a lot to deal with. As his wrestling partner said, Jacob strived with everybody, competed, sweated, wrestled, argued, bargained, bartered, That kind of life is not a peaceful one. But it seems that for Jacob, it was his nature. And you know that nature doesn't seem to be a problem for God. God just says, that's who you are. God loves him. But it does create a problem for Jacob in his everyday dealings, his relationships with his family and friends. And he does have to deal with the consequences of his actions. So he crossed the river into Canaan, into the land God had promised Abraham, had promised Jacob, now Israel, to meet Esau. And in chapter 33, Esau greeted Jacob with open arms and a welcome home, which was so not what Jacob was expecting. Jacob had grown up, and I think so had Esau. Jacob insisted that Esau take the gifts of animals and wealth, though Esau argued and said, I have my own stuff, it's fine. He finally agreed when um, Jacob said, if I find favor with you, then accept the present from my hand, for truly to see your face is like seeing the face of God, since you have received me with such great favor. Please accept my gift that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have everything he want, I want. So Jacob urged him and he took it. It meant something to Jacob to repay what he had done. Even if Esau didn't need it, it was important for the sake of Esau, Jacob's soul to do that. And the story goes on because Jacob, it says to, because there were so many of them that Esau moved into another land and became Edom. But I imagine part of it was Jacob was the heir to Isaac. So Esau moved out of that land and founded the nation that would be called Edom. And Edom over time became a nation that struggled with Israel over and over. One could argue that that struggle continues today, symbolically, even if those who compete over Israel aren't direct descendants of Esau or Israel. But it is a struggle. The struggle with God, with life continues in us, individually, as we meet problems in our life, as sometimes we create problems in our lives, And the struggle with God, with life, continues in our communities as well. We struggle and wonder if God can or truly will help us as we see the devastation of disease and war and violence. The Jewish people who suffered through the Holocaust have written devastatingly honest books and poetry about their angry and anguished questions for God.
people who have suffered as slaves, as descendants of slaves, carry anger within them, speak with anger in them, to God, to us, because people who took them from the places where they were living called themselves Christians. People have suffered abuse at the hands of leaders in churches and are angry about those things and struggle. Even if they want to believe, they struggle because of the messengers that have brought them the news of Jesus Christ. There are greater and lesser struggles in our lives. We all have times we need to struggle with the decisions we've made, mistakes we've had in our past. Sometimes we carry them too long. We need to let God forgive us and let ourselves be forgiven inside ourselves. And sometimes we need to do things that help us get past those mistakes. Come face to face with ourselves and with God. Actually ask forgiveness and then know that it is given. Some of us may need to seek the forgiveness of family or friends or others when our actions have hurt others. And though we may not be the instigators of suffering in all things, I'm not saying that, this text can help us give voice to questions about how it feels to struggle. We can strive with God. We can strive with others, wrestle with them who believe in God. And we can argue with one another in compassion and truth and love and try to figure out ways of reconciling with each other. Jacob may not always be the best example of how to be a human being, but he's probably a very true example of how it is to be a human being. His life can lead us to re-examine not only our own lives, but our life as a society and a culture because he comes to represent a whole nation. And how a lived out life can be blessing, even in the midst of all the mistakes. We can find where it is that God's persistent blessing is to be found. But we can't do it without facing who we are, without coming face to face with God and how it is that God wants us to live. To the glory of our one God, past, present, and forever. Amen.